can't believe I'm really here! Psychonauts headquarters! Ow! Sorry, new ball. Wow! I'm Lisette Teaching Montgomery, and I'm the art director in Psychonauts 2. And I'm Lauren Scott. I'm senior systems designer, uh, and I'm working on uh, everything from meta systems to combat to lots and lots of odds and ends. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start off maybe uh, with a, a current situation question. Um, how did uh, COVID and the whole situation from the pandemic uh, uh, hit you in the, in the development of the game or impact in the development of the game? Sure, I'll take take this one. Um, for us, it was a pretty easy transition. Um, thankfully, at Double Fine, we had some full-time employees who were permanently off-site. There were some long-term employees who had moved out of state. So we had the sort of systems in place that we needed to to have most of the team switch to work from home. So it was a bit of a rough transition for the first few weeks, I'm sure, for the IT team, as everyone kind of moved their PCs home and got it integrated. But I think once we all got home and the kinks worked out, you know, it kind of was a, a smoother transition than we anticipated. I mean, we all went through COVID and we all had our challenges and struggles with, you know, being in this isolation and having depression and all the stresses of just the whole world going through this. But I think we all kind of leaned into the fact that we were all going through this together and we were still trying to to make this game and we were all grateful that we still had jobs and were able to do this. Um, so the, 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 the launch of the first game is a, is a bit uh, behind in the past. Um, was, there, was there ever um, 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 was there ever a time when you considered uh, remastering or remaking the first game because it's uh, at the moment in the, in the, in the Xbox Game Pass? Uh, in the in the original version? No, um, I don't think we ever really like considered stopping making Psychonauts 2 to remaster Psychonauts 1. Is that was that your question? Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> it was very, very important for Tim to to go through and write this story for Psychonauts 2. He had had a vision for what the story should be. Um, you know, pretty soon right after the last one and he had some some hooks in the first story so i think it was very important for him to continue this story and continue the legacy of psychonauts too so i don't think any of it crossed our minds um, other than maybe you know making it available on xbox series x and the new consoles um but um we we were definitely de determined to finish this one okay um maybe in terms of uh, introducing new players to the game uh since it's the, the second iteration um, how will you introduce uh, the game to players that haven't finished the first game or haven't even touched the first game? Sure. Um, I'll let Lauren speak to how we tutorialize things, but um, from a narrative standpoint, when you first um, play the game, there is a previously on video that gets people up to speed on what happened in the first game and in Rambits of Ruin. So there is a bit of a, an opportunity to on-ramp people, at least from a narrative standpoint. And from a gameplay and combat standpoint, uh, we definitely made sure that some of the old powers came back and that new elements were tutorialized. And I'll let Lauren take a little bit more since this is her area of expertise. Yeah, so uh, having a sequel, it's kind of uh, an interesting line to walk because uh, you have a character that has already gone through this whole like journey in the first game and has, you know, leveled up and gotten a bunch of powers. Um, and you have a lot of fans and people that already know them and love them and are already very well versed in the lore. And then you have a ton of people who have never played the game before who maybe see the game on Game Pass and are like, I want to try this out. So you have to sort of serve both. Um, so in tutorializing things, we uh, set up a, a narrative and um, sort of an experience that supports both of those, uh, that uh, eases players into uh, sort of the set of four powers that they're going to have at the beginning, uh, but does it in sort of like a quick snappy way and within a really like fun, fast paced uh, uh, sort of uh, story. So um, so that's sort of what we did to juggle those two like uh, gameplay needs there. 
uh, in some some first footage that was released, uh, there was some uh, 2D, uh, 2.5D uh, sections uh, that were new in the, in the second game. Uh, could you go into detail with that? Um, uh, where, um, how do you uh, how did you expand on on uh, showing the the, the the psyches of the of the characters and and the world? Sure. Um, I think a good example of that is uh, what you've probably played, which is the Cassie collection level, which is based on Cassiopeia, and you kind of go into her mind, and it's a bit of a library. So we're really, and you're kind of going in and out of books because her whole psyche is kind of structured around, um, you know, her love of books because she's an author. So for us, we kind of start with writing prompts from Tim. So he'll say we're going to this character's mind. This is the specific mental issue that she we have to help her solve. And these are some of the high level concepts of what I can see her brain looking like. And then that concept uh, would essentially go to a small strike team. So we had the small level teams, which was a strike team of four or five people that are cross discipline. So it would be a level artist, a level designer, a concept artist, an animator, and a VFX person, someone around to kind of help them. Kind of, it's a small enough team to get a little you know, get some real work done. So that team immediately starts brainstorming. We like get into sketches, we start thinking about what this world could look like. And then the designer goes off and starts doing some minor prototyping to figure out what we can do to get those mechanics to support the story. And then um, our environment artists run off and do a little pretty corner, which helps us test whether the visuals for that brain level are going to work. And they all sort of come together. So that's sort of like our pre-production for our brain. Once we get through that process and we say, okay, this is this is going to be, this is going to work. We think this concept can really move forward. Then we take that and we move it. Tim continues to write more and more story. And then we start kind of laying out the, the form of the level based on the story beats that Tim wants to happen and all of the gameplay moments that happen between there. So that's a really high level, quick explanation of like how we approach something like a brain level. So a general question, uh, how is it working with, with Tim? Because in the in the presentations and the events, he's uh, a pretty funny guy. Uh, is he also like that in the studio or? Sure, what was that like for you, Lauren? Um, it's been uh, really cool, like in terms of how he handles uh, other people's ideas, he's always really uh, open to things. Um, and he really believes in everybody's uh, creative potential. Um, like we get ideas from like ideas from all corners of the team. Like designers aren't the only ones that submit design ideas uh, and stuff like that. And he has a way of sort of like taking everything and uh, you know amalgamating them into like a cool idea or concept or sort of like driving that. So. And he doesn't like shut things down just because he's the boss, you know. So um, yeah, I think he creates a pretty good creative environment. Yeah, it's a really fun creative environment. I will find um, Tim is hilarious, and just by default. <laughs> so our daily meetings I always end up somebody doubled over laughing. But I think that humor also serves as creativity, and it serves the creativity of the team. Um, so when you feel free to express yourself, so your best ideas come out, and I think Psychonauts reflects that. So the game uh, features a lot of serious uh, themes uh, in contrast to that. Um, is it is it hard for you working on that, uh, the exploring those the serious themes, or uh, maybe talking to to people about this uh, these themes? Um, I wouldn't say it was difficult because you know it was very important for us to approach these themes with empathy. Um, you know, double fine doesn't punch down. You know, we're not gonna you know we may make jokes, but it's not at somebody's expense. And so for us, it was really about making sure that we approach each of these characters issues with empathy and two um that people were still having fun playing through this we wanted to make sure that this is still a fun comedic game um so you know we touch on some dark subjects but we handle it with lightness and humor yeah as a designer it's an interesting challenge to approach subject matter like that and uh, attempt to create fun out of it uh, so it, it was interesting on the design side as well. Yeah, I think a really great example of that that Lauren did amazingly was the panic attack. Um, it was featured in our 2019 E3 
demo and trailer. But uh, that particular enemy, it's literally based on what it feels like to have a panic attack come on. And the combat team and Lauren specifically did an amazing job making you literally feel like a panic attack is coming on when you approach this enemy. Um, so much so that when our game was, you know, we were getting consultation from our mental health experts at Take This, uh, the psychologist himself had suffered from panic attacks and he was like that is exactly what it feels like when I have one so I think we really kind of made sure we nailed you know the important parts of the story and that that specific enemy and the enemy sort of reflect the things that go on in people's mind um, how much expanding on on uh, the, the, the the previous game like on, in terms of uh, layers in the levers and, and the scale of the levers and, uh, and the features uh, can players expect because it's uh, a big step from a original Xbox game to, to the next-gen uh, consoles? Sure. Lauren? Uh, yeah. Um, so we definitely uh, expanded a ton. Uh, one thing that we really wanted to focus on was, uh, you know, we have this game with a really amazing story um, and a, a linear experience, but all across the game we wanted to make sure that the player has as many opportunities for choice as possible. Um, so, uh, for example, in the first game, you have upgrades that are just totally linear. You you rank up, but the upgrades are sort of just foisted on you in, in a preset order. In this game, uh, you are able to rank up and actually earn upgrade points um, to then spend on upgrades as you uh, as you want, uh, so you can sort of focus on the powers that you like the best first and customize your experience that way. And we even went a step further and introduced uh, these items called pins that are even further uh, customization on your powers. So we have like, um, you can buy like uh, cosmetic pins that change the color of your ball or give, you know, some fancy sparkles to your like melee. And then you also have pins with utility that like uh, increase your damage, but uh, also increase the damage that's done to you um, and modify your powers in other ways. So you can equip three of those and uh, sort of even further like focus on what you want to do. And then, uh, you know, just in the uh, hub world, like in the physical world, there are tons of side quests, tons of um, characters to talk to, like everyone has something to say. Uh, so the world is, is pretty open for the player to just go and explore um, and just uh, really enjoy the world that uh, Tim and the team have created. Yeah, I would say from a visual standpoint, we really focused on trying to push the really great legacy of style that we inherited from Psychonauts 1. Um, the, the concept of wonk is the, you know, the primary visual style. So everything is a little off kilter, nothing's the same size, everything kind of feels a little off because you're inside of a dreamscape in a brain world. So for us, it was taking that really great style and pushing the visuals as far as we could with the technology we have. So you see that a lot in the cinematics and the transitions and the visual effects, even things like character shaders and water, like all of that was super pushed um, while also kind of having this signature Psychonaut style. Are there any, any other games or uh, musicians or artists you can mention without spoiling too much uh, that inspired you in some of the levers or in, in the story? I would say uh, we are primarily mostly inspired by what we did right on Psychonauts 1. We really didn't want to like copycat other games. We really wanted to say, how can we make the Psychonauts universe better? Um, while also looking at the landscape of what is essentially the a modern platformer and what people expect and how can we can I include that so as lauren was touching on we wanted a deeper combat experience um so we have a, a deeper pin system and, a, and an upgrade system and on art we also wanted to kind of make sure visually that they were there and i think for tim he left some narrative hooks in the last game that he wanted to kind of thread through on this one um and so i think you start to see that when you start playing through the demo uh, Tim mentioned in the last, in the last showcase uh, mental connections. Um, can you already uh, give us some details on that? Because it was it was a bit touched on uh, in the stream, I think. But 
uh, I'm not really sure players can already uh, grasp how this uh, how this going to change the game or the, the, the gameplay. Yeah, so uh, Mental Connection is one of the new powers that you get pretty early on in the game. Um, I think you get it in one of the levels that you're going to play, uh, Hollis. Um, and uh, what is basically, um, there are little nodes in the world, little like floaty things that are uh, little ideas uh, that are in like brain worlds and even some in the physical world that Raz can use mental connection uh, to connect to them. And uh, he can actually also use it to connect like two concepts together and make things happen. So um, its use is sort of uh, like twofold in exploration. In exploration, uh, you're able to use it as a traversal tool. Um, at higher levels, there are even like special like dark nodes that you're able to unlock to get to even further places. And then in combat, you're able to use it to zip around the battlefield. Uh, you can actually use it to bring smaller enemies to you or to uh, sort of, uh, what is it, like dash toward bigger enemies. And as you upgrade it, you can add on like a melee attack, um, and with pins, you can even customize it to like root enemies or to drain their health. So uh, yeah, it has a lot of utility in, in both uh, both those areas. Um, besides uh, COVID impacting the, the development, is there one one uh, section or one one part of the development that was uh, really challenging for you that you can talk about, like uh, gameplay wise or integrating new systems? Um, well, designing an economy is always hard because it has a ton of little teeny tiny pieces that you have to keep track of. Uh, and you sort of have to be both at the high level looking at the entire thing at once and also at the low level, at the feature level, looking at every single um, specific feature. And we did um, add on a few things to the economy this time. Like I said, like upgrade points. Uh, we also added a few new collectibles. Um, and then Psychonauts 1 already had, you know, a ton of really cool uh, collectibles that we wanted to make sure we integrated and, and kept there. So um, just keeping track of all of that and just making sure that uh, all of those pieces added up to the experience that we wanted, which is uh, like every collectible has uh, a purpose. There are no, you know, uh, use, useless or, or whatever collectibles and that uh, going around and finding things felt uh, felt fun and uh, occasionally like surprising and cool and really took you to all of the farthest edges of all of our amazing environments so that you could see like every single piece of uh, the amazing stuff that the environment team put together. So uh, we just wanted to make sure that all of our econ features supported uh, the rest of the game. Uh, so that was challenging, but I think it's come together pretty well. Yeah, it has. I think from a design standpoint on the art side, uh, the brain levels are definitely our, were our biggest challenge. Um, the bosses were also challenging, but because of the nature of Psychonauts, um, every brain level needed to look and feel extremely different from the last one. Our general approach is that, you know, no two humans are the same, so no two brain levels should look exactly the same. So for us, we essentially had to kick off pre-production every single time. So that sort of design process expanded over multiple levels was certainly challenging to sustain. But I do think it like, reaped the rewards of the game feeling unique all the way through. Like you're not gonna, it doesn't feel like you're grinding through the same level three times. You're literally in three different, completely different levels. I think that's the strength of the Psychonauts. Okay, maybe a final question uh, for each one of you. Uh, is there one um, feature in the game or one part uh, you can talk about that you really want people to see, explore? Mm, let's see. Um, I would say for me, it's important for players to understand that this is a single player game. You only get to experience it for the first time once. So enjoy the cutscenes. This is a cinematic game. We put a lot of effort and time into telling this story. 
watch the cutscenes, explore the worlds, collect every collectible, because we really tried to make sure there was an experience where you were enjoying every moment of this game. So this isn't a speed runner. Don't jump in and try to just jump from mission to mission. This is a cinematic experience and it should be approached that way. Yeah, and for me, there have been a lot of things that I talked about um, that are new that I, I really want people to dig into, like uh, upgrades, pins, um, and all of that, and the new powers, obviously. Uh, but one thing I guess that I haven't talked about as much is um, our combat. We really made a huge effort to tighten things up and uh, to make things feel more fluid, to make Raz feel more acrobatic uh, during combat and to make sure all the powers um, are useful and um, usually have at least one enemy that is sort of weak to it and then one enemy that's sort of a foil to it um, loosely. Uh, we've also uh, created a few new enemies uh, that I uh, can't wait for people to try. We have the panic attack that Lizette talked about. Uh, we have an enabler that's able to make other enemies invulnerable. Um, and we have a, a judge that's this big burly guy with a gavel uh, who's really mean and uh, hurts a lot. Um, and then a, a bad mood who uh, actually uses the power clairvoyance in combat, which is exciting. Um, so we really did take pains to uh, incorporate every single power into combat and make all of them interesting and to make sure that all of the enemies sort of interplay with each other and uh, create really cool dynamics while you're fighting. So that's going to be a fun one, I think, for people. Okay. Thanks for taking your time. It was great. I'm really looking forward to the game. Yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to you playing as well. <laughs>